Okay. Um, I'm going to follow up on, on Carl's point and other people's point about complexity, surprise, multi-level interactions. Uh, and I thought it was really interesting to hear some more elaborations about the role of models in IPCC. Because there is a tendency within policy, I would say, but also within the social sciences that if you get the models right, then you, you will know what to do, right? Uh, but the point is that even though you might have perfect models, there will always be an element of surprise. That's, some people call it the black, black swans. Other people call it uh, low probability, high impact events. And if you look into the pol political science literature and theory building around institutional challenges of environmental change, a lot of the literature focuses on incremental and predictable change. The question is, how do we deal with surprise in smart ways, right? And the irony is, of course, that our plan to talk about new emerging and re-emerging infectious disease. The same reason why I'm standing here, because Thomas cannot be here after getting, after getting a cold in Mexico. Uh, and I think the swine flu epidemic is just one example of the sort of steering challenges that we're facing. It's something that unfolds quite rapidly. We're not really sure what it is, but we know that we need to mobilize across scales. And it's not, I mean, the, the swine flu epidemic, it's not a unique phenomena. Uh, now we got caught up here. There we go. Uh, actually, there was another outbreak, not a global one, but, uh, but in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro in, in 2008, where you, in a, a matter of months, actually had an explosion of dengue, uh, dengue fever outbreak. And once you get that sort of surprise element uh, in, into, into a government, uh, that, that sort of challenges the whole way things are steered, right? It, it sort of overwhelms the capacity of, of both strong and weak states. Uh, uh, one very obvious way to look at it, if you read uh, articles about the outbreak, is that people uh, start to blame government for doing something wrong or, or we were not prepared enough and people really rapidly uh, lose trust to each other and, and to politicians. And again, the case of, of, of Rio, Brazil, emerging and re-emerging infectious disease is not unique. Right? If you look, this is a map that shows the spread or the distribution of, of this mosquito vector Aedes aegypti in Latin America in the 1970s, right? In the 1970s, you could find this vector for dengue fever in only some parts of Latin America. In 2002, you can actually find that mosquito in almost the whole continent. And the question is, what has increased uh, the spread of this vector, what, what has increased our vulnerability uh, uh, for new health challenges. Obviously, that's, again, to bring up the point that now we die. <laughs> the guy over there does like this. <laughs> yeah, surprise element. The lamp died. We had a warning sign that we actually read, so... Uh, Five minutes. It, there's a... Yeah. yeah I, mean, I can continue. Do you want to talk without your pictures, or do you want us to have some questions and you come back when you have the, your pictures? I'm not going to take questions now. No. That, <laughs> then it would be questions for various people, not only for you. So you okay. But is it five minutes? Five minutes, yeah. So we can I'd rather do it without, actually, for okay, five great. minutes. I think it's easier, otherwise... So the question is, what, what has induced uh, these sort of changes in, in, uh, in uh, spread of, of infectious disease, in this case, dengue? And that's exactly Carl's point, and I think the point that we are making to, to the climate change community. It's multiple changes. It's not only climate change. It's land use change. It's rapid urbanization. It's infrastructural development. Uh, it's eroded health infrastructure in the 80s and 90s. It's a tendency to focus on quick fix solutions once you get outbreaks. So you increase uh, uh, the resistant vectors. And there are also, of course, some climatic factors involved. So it's all this mix of interacting social, ecological, human, economical factors that trigger surprises. And now we seem to be getting it. All right. 
So how do we do institutional sense of these challenges? Again, we're dealing with multiple drivers, social, economical, ecological. We're dealing with multiple impacts. It's not only health impacts, it's also ecological impacts, economical impacts, security impacts. And at the same time, we, we know that responses have to be multi-scale. Normally, when people talk about climate change, they think it's a global policy challenge. In fact, it's a multi-level governance challenge. Responses have to be at multiple levels. And again, it's not only a question for health. If you look at uh, the coral reef example that, that Carl brought up, it's also a matter of multiple drivers, multiple impact, multiple level responses that are needed. The world food crisis that we'd experience, exactly the same thing. So it's, it's a generic sustainability governance challenge that we face. with. One way to structure it, and this comes from a collaboration that the Resilience Center has been having with Christmart at the Swedish Defense College for uh, one or two years, is to frame these challenges as crises, societal crises. What do we know about crises? First of all, they are fast evolving events with very high uncertainty. Think about the swine flu, think about avian influenza, think about invasive species, uh, etc. Second thing that defines, that, that uh, separates a crisis from incremental environmental change is that it threatens core social functions, right? And it challenges central institutions. If you have a government that isn't good enough or, or fast enough in responding to a crisis, people will start challenging the legitimacy of that government. The third one is that because of uncertainty, uh, it forces policymakers to make decisions under very limited time. Right? It's the same for the swine flu. You don't know exactly what it is, but you have to respond. People expect you to respond. So how do we, again, how do we make institutional sense of crises, crisis events? Normally in environmental policy literature, uh, there's a lot of focus on collective action problems, uh, environmental policy integration, et cetera, et cetera. I would say that these are new institutional challenges if you want to talk about crises and crisis events. First of all, what you need to do in, in different phases of a crisis is to talk about early warnings. What structures do you have in place in your government or at the global level to get early warnings? It's not a pure scientific question. It's also a matter of institutional design and policy. Right? Do you have the, the proper structure in place? The second one is what we're seeing at the moment, again with the swine flu as an example, sense making. What is going on? Who is responsible? What is the source of the problem? Where is the proper, where, where uh, in what level of government is, is the response uh, most effective, for example? Once you're Going through that phase, you also at the same time have to coordinate promptly and respond promptly, which in itself is a big challenge. And hopefully once the crisis is over, learning reform, maybe even an improved system that Carl mentioned. The problem for governance in general, I mean, normally when people talk about health or think about health and, and the responses to uh, epidemic outbreaks, they're thinking that WHO is in charge of everything. This is an illustration from a report by Ian Schoons and colleagues in the UK that show the, uh, the diversity of actors that you actually have involved in dealing with avian influenza outbreaks. Right? So you have the WHO there, of course, then you have a whole family uh, in this alphabet soup of different monitoring systems for different things. Uh, you have different ministries of health. Here you have the business community and other sorts of international organizations. You have US uh, ministries, UNICEF, media, uh, private companies up here. So the question is, how do you secure early warning, sense making, prompt response, learning in a setting that is so fragmented in this soup? So that's a true challenge. So now moving into more of the optimistic part of my talk. Uh, this is a quote from an interview I did with David Heyman at the WHO a year ago, David Heyman is sort of uh, the mastermind actually behind uh, pandemic preparedness. So he's the person that has built up the whole institutional structure that we're now seeing being mobilized to combat the swine flu. And his message was, I'm just gonna, I guess people in the back are not able to read it. 
all of a sudden we had a very powerful system that brought in much more information from more countries and we were able to go to countries confidentiality, confidentially and validate what was going on and if they needed help we provided help. And we provided help by bringing together many different institutions from around the world that started to work with us. Right? And he talks about a development from the, from the mid 1990s. And this whole process of getting better early warnings and facilitating coordination was supported by the evolution of information technology. Right? So the, the evolution of information technology, the rapid spread of information from one part to the world to the other, is reducing transaction costs. I mean, it's fairly, it's free. I mean, sending information from one part of the, con uh, one part of the world to another is free now, very easy. And at the same time, it reduces transaction costs for collective action, which builds stronger capacity to deal with surprise. That's my take on it. So here's another map. You're probably not able to see anything and you don't have to see the details, but it's not the fragmented nature of global governance. It's not uncoordinated. It's not a total mess. In fact, what you see are different linkages between different actors. You see a global capacity to communicate across international organizations, non-state actors, etc., etc. So for example, here you have the WHO, but it's also uh, collaborating closely with USAID, UNDG, the Afro-WHO Int, the World Food Program, Relief Web. Uh, here you get, have the Americans and the American organization, the Red Cross, the European Center for Disease Control, etc., etc. So there is some communication, there is coordination going on at the global level, and that is facilitated by uh, information technology, I would say. So that's more hopeful in a sense. It's not all messy and complex and impossible to coordinate. So just to wrap up, what are the implications for policy, climate change policy, development ecosystem? First of all, I mean, obviously we need to deal with non-risk makers, exactly what Carl talked about. We know what sort of things that policy or, or other actors are doing that reduce resilience. We know that already, right? Or coral reefs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But on the other hand, you not only need to deal with sort of uh, these slow drivers, you also have to build some sort of capacity to deal with interactions, which is the surprise element. Th that's doable, that's something you can do, but it's something different compared to more environmental policy or institutional reforms to focus on more slow incremental change. And the third aspect uh, is that even though we live in a much more interconnected, messy and global risk, planet, there is a way to look at it as a, as a global pool of ingenuity, diversity, and innovation. Uh, I think our, our strength lies in there. I think the swine flu case shows not only the risk involved in globalization, but actually show us what the global community can do together quite rapidly despite crises, high uncertainty, and, and limited time to act. I think that's it. Thank you for listening.